from the New Testament. I will be reading Paul's letter to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning at verse 24. Hear the word of God. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word and all that it teaches us. Now we pray that your spirit would uh, bring to life your, your word to us, that we might understand the depths, the truths held within. Lord, grant me uh, the power of your spirit as I, I share these words with the people this morning. Lord, we enlighten us, grant us spiritual growth as we hear your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Throughout uh, history, the temple in Jerusalem, or as it is called in the Hebrew Bible, the house of Jehovah, is arguably the most important architectural structure built by man. It was unique in that it was considered the only sanctified house of worship in Israel. Now, in actuality, there were two temples. The first was built by King Solomon, and he recognized it as the sole place of Jewish sacrifice to replace what was called the tabernacle. And the tabernacle was like a portable tent. It, the, the Jews and Moses took it with them as they traveled throughout the wilderness, and then it continued to be used through the reign of King David. So Solomon's temple was glorious. It was magnificent in size and appearance. The whole world at the, at the time recognized that this is where the Hebrew God dwelt. According to the Hebrews, Jehovah was the only God. All these other gods were false gods. They were made up by man. Israel worshipped the one true God. And, and of course, this caused a lot of contention and conflict among Israel's neighbors who worshipped pagan gods. Solomon's temple was built about 950 years before Jesus was born. 400 years later, after the Babylonians defeated Israel, that temple, Solomon's temple, was completely destroyed. All the stones were torn down. All the gold was taken away. Now, after the Israelites were set free from Babylon, by the authority of Cyrus the Great, this Persian king, the second temple was completed about 500 B.C. on the very same spot. It was called the Temple Mount. Then, about five, uh, 170 B.C., the Greek Empire took over, and they tried to force the Jewish priests to sacrifice to the various Greek gods in the temple. Well, the Jewish priests refused to do this. So the Hellenistic priests, or the Greek priests, were ordered to erect a statue of Zeus right there in the temple and sacrifice pigs to the statue of, Ju uh, of Zeus. This became known throughout Jewish literature as the abomination of desolation when these sacrifices of, of, of pigs were made to the Greek gods in the temple of Jehovah. 
Now what followed there in 160 BC was a series of Jewish rebellions against the Greek, uh, the Greek Empire, and it resulted in a great victory by a fellow by the name of Judas Maccabeus. He rededicated the Temple of Jehovah, and the Jews to this day celebrate that historical victory as part of their festival known as Hanukkah. You didn't know you were going to get a history lesson today. Then, the Roman Empire eventually overpowered the Greek Empire, and around 20 BC, King Herod was appointed by Rome to rule over Israel, and he renovated and expanded the temple. It became known as Herod's Temple. And of course, this is the structure of Jesus' day. This is the one that we read about in the New Testament. Now, 70 years after Jesus was born, and, and, and about 40 years after he died, the Jews rebelled against Rome. And when they rebelled against Rome, the Romans laid siege to the city, and they completely destroyed the temple, taking one stone, not leaving one stone upon another. It has never been rebuilt since then, since 70 AD. 700 years after Christ was born, a Muslim mosque was built on this site, on the Temple Mount. And that Muslim mosque is there to this day. It is known as the Dome of the Rock, and you've probably seen it now and again in the news. Certainly, you can understand how important this temple has been to the history of mankind and its influence on how humankind's perspective has been shaped concerning our, our conception of God and who God is. To the Israelites, this temple was the focus of faith. This is where God's living presence dwelt. This is where God's promises and God's covenants were embraced. This is where meaningful worship transpired. In our Old Testament reading today, Psalm 30, the heading above the psalm states, this is a psalm for the dedication of the temple. Now, throughout history, the temple was dedicated three times, as far as I know, as I've done my studies. In, in King Solomon's day, right after it was built, of course, it was dedicated. Then, in 500 B.C., after the Babylonian captivity, when it was rebuilt, it was dedicated. And then, in 160 B.C., during that Maccabean era, after the abomination of death and desolation, after those sacrifices were made to the false gods in God's temple, <coughs> it was rededicated. The first few verses reflect here in Psalm 30 both an individual's struggle and stormy spiritual journey from the darkest valley to the glorious mountaintop as well as the temple's stormy history. Psalm 30, verses 1 through 3. I will exalt you, Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and you did not let my enemies gloat over me. Lord my God, I called to you for help and you healed me. You, Lord, brought me up from the realm of the dead and spared me from going down into the pit. Just like the temple itself, the psalmist has gone through some incredibly difficult times. He, he claims there were times when he felt like he was in the realm of the dead, that his life was destroyed. I, I don't know what happened in his life. Maybe he made some bad decisions. Maybe it was the circumstances surrounding him. But then God reached down and pulled him up and rebuilt his life. There's a, a clear theme in this psalm of God in, in his exasperation with us. Brings us down into that valley and, and we suffer the consequences of, of our decisions. It, it, he kind of casts us into that night of weeping. But then... 
When we look back up to God, we begin to learn a spiritual lesson, and, and then God brings the morning to us. He brings restoration and joy and opportunity to rededicate ourselves. Then we get complacent again. We think we have it all together again. We get to the mountaintop. It's time for another lesson. God withdraws his presence, and down we go. And the pattern continues. God lifts us up, and we grow spiritually. Then we mess up, and down we go again. God lifts us back up, back into the fold. We rededicate ourselves, and, and it's like this spiritual rhythm that we go through in life. And it kind of matches the history of the temple, its construction, its glory, its destruction, its devastation. It's reconstruction. It's glory again. And then it's abomination. And then it's rededication. So it kind of follows a, a pattern. Now, during Jesus' day, the temple was magnificent because of King Herod's desire to be recognized as one of the world's great leaders. King Herod poured money, poured decorations and upkeep and additions into, into this temple. But this is what Jesus had to say about the temple of King Herod's day. Mark 13, 1 and 2. It says, as Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Jesus says, do you see all of these great buildings? Not one stone here will be left upon another. Every one will be thrown down. Jesus foresaw what was coming. He understood that what could be considered one of the world's most significant structures was about to be totally destroyed by the Roman Empire. Then in John chapter 2, after Jesus cleared the temple courts of the sheep and the cattle and the money changers, the Jewish authorities confronted him, confront him, John 2, 18 through 20. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, It's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. Clearly, Jesus introduces an important transition here. This magnificent, magnificent structure, this physical temple will be totally destroyed, but God's presence and power is about to find a new home. Jesus declared, my body is the temple of the living God. Your bodies were designed to be the temples of the living God. Herod's temple, the symbol of God's presence and power in the world, will be destroyed, but God has a new model, a new ideal, a new order. Now this is how the Apostle Paul described the new paradigm in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Listen to what Paul says. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. See, this is the new ideal, and it presents a whole new perspective on what temple dedication is all about. We now have the responsibility of dedicating God's temple, your body, my body to the work of God's kingdom. If we are called to dedicate this temple of our bodies to the high calling of God's will, to service in the company of God's kingdom, then what practical steps should we follow? <coughs> what does the dedication of this temple of our bodies encompass? Well, think about it. Certainly, we are more than just physical bodies. We have this amazing, highly developed brain 
that becomes really the control center of our lives, physically, mentally, and spiritually. These bodies, these temples, comprise a trinity of body, mind, and spirit. Therefore, when we are instructed to dedicate the temple of our bodies, we need to understand that the whole person, mind, body, spirit, should be dedicated to God and the work of the Lord. Now, I believe the Apostle Paul had the best analogy that effectively explained what it means to dedicate this temple, mind, body, and spirit, to God and to God's purpose for one's life. 1 Corinthians 9, 24, 25, he says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Interestingly, Paul picked an Olympic athlete for an example of temple dedication, committing mind, body, and soul to serving the Lord. And it's easy to understand why. Olympic athletes have an incredible passion for their sport. They know they must be 100% committed to rise to the level of world-class competition. They are dedicated mentally. They study. They learn technique. They try out all the different training programs to see which one is best. They study to find out what is best. They are dedicated physically. They spend hours and hours of day training. They have a special diet. They, they eat right. They get proper sleep. They are dedicated spiritually. They envision victory. They expel any negative thoughts that erode their determination and their confidence. They adopt a winner's attitude. Paul said that Christians need to aspire to the Olymp uh, Olympic athlete's example. Only our passion is not for a wreath that will not last, but for God and God's kingdom, which are eternal. Mentally, we need to dedicate ourselves to grow in the knowledge of God's word, in the knowledge of who God is in God's ways. Physically, we are to dedicate ourselves, taking care of these bodies that God has given us, eating right, exercise, getting enough sleep. Spiritually, we are to dedicate ourselves, opening ourselves to God's presence, daily meeting with the Lord, becoming sensitive to the voice of God's Spirit within us. See, God has given us this temple which comprises mind, body, and spirit. And God has given believers the Holy Spirit to dwell within this temple. Let us respond to God's goodness and generosity and grace like that Olympic athlete dedicates himself to victory. All that we are, this temple, dedicated to God. Amen. This time, let's prepare for communion.